Awesome. I hope you're excited for this talk uh, because this, this talk has everything. Uh, we have my social security number, my mother's maiden name, the email that I briefly used 11 years ago, and last but not least, accidental phishing. And what is accidental phishing? Well, it's that thing where you call into a call center and you start talking to them, but you've only given them one piece of identity information. And so all of a sudden you're having this conversation with them and they start talking about you like you're not you. And so you ask them for your phone number and they give you something that's not your phone number. And then you get them to change it and you realize after you hang up that you just fish somebody and you weren't trying to, but it was because they had bad security practices over the phone. So, you know, these are things that happened uh, in the course of my research doing contact center authentication. Uh, so when I set out to do this, I wasn't super excited about it. I didn't think it was going to be that interesting. I thought I was just going to spend a bunch of time on this phone with call centers. <laughs> Uh, but it turned out being really, really fascinating to do this research and to call into all of these call centers. Uh, I did a decent amount of research for this talk, but it, it basically involved a lot of time on hold and jumping through automated phone systems trying to get to talk to an agent so that I could figure out what I needed to know about how different companies were authenticating their users over the phone. Uh, so quick show of hands, uh, how many people work for a company that has a customer support line? And leave your hands up if you've ever called that customer support line. OK, so a couple of you. I hope by the end of this talk, you'll be a little bit inspired to call into your customer support line and think about the way that your company is doing that type of authentication. Um, so a little bit about me. My name is Kelly Robinson. I work at a company called Twilio. Uh, aside from making coffee, we also do API communications. Uh, so we do things like sending and receiving text messages, making and receiving voice calls. And so a lot of people use Twilio to build their call centers, and that's kind of what inspired me to start doing this research. Uh, I also work on the Authy products at Twilio, and so if you're not familiar, Authy is a two-factor authentication uh, app and API, and those are, uh, it was a company that was acquired by Twilio about five years ago, and so I happen to work on the, the two-factor authentication, a lot of the identity management side of things that Twilio offers. And so there's really the intersection of those things that, uh, with the call centers and the authentication that I spend a lot of time thinking about, and another part of my job is educating developers about how they can build more security into their applications. And I started thinking about how, you know, most people I talk to are doing this with web applications, but why can't we extend this to applications that are built over the phone? So a little bit about the research that I did and uh, how I kind of set this up. Uh, so I had to decide who to call, right? Um, and this wasn't too sophisticated. I had to have an existing account there. I wasn't trying to fish anybody that wasn't myself intentionally. Uh, there had to be personal information tied to my account. And so this was things like information about data, uh, data about myself or recent orders or um, billing information, that kind of stuff. Uh, the customer, uh, the company had to have a customer support line. Uh, this sounds straightforward, but surprise surprisingly wasn't obvious, and there's a lot of places out there that don't make it easy to find their customer support line. Uh, I did focus this research on uh, the United States, and so there are companies that offer international support, and obviously this is something that uh, is done in other countries, but all of the research that I did involved USA 1-800 numbers mostly. And finally, I focused on inbound calls. And so there is the use case where a call center will call you, either because you prompt them to or out of the blue. You know, Comcast might try to call you up and get you to renegotiate uh, your contract with them for another two years. I focus specifically on inbound calls because authenticating outbound calls is just a different type of problem, in my opinion, and outside of the scope of this talk. Uh, also, with a few exceptions, I almost always bypassed all of the automated phone systems, so I wasn't trying to use the automation that they were offering, and I wanted to get on the phone with an actual person. And I'll talk about why that mattered in a little bit. Um, and I also always called from my own phone, um, and so a lot of times these places are using that as a way to uh, authenticate you and identify you. And so I didn't do any phone spoofing, and I didn't do any research uh, calling in with a different phone number. Um, and I would occasionally ask for a different additional details about the security that they saw on the other end, but I didn't ever tell the agents that I was doing this for research. And so as much as possible, I tried to get this to be a conversation that they would have with any other customer calling in. 
I also needed to have a use case for calling them. And so there were uh, all these places to have information tied to my account. And most of the time I was just asking about uh, recent orders or information about my account. And so most of the time that I was doing this, I was doing basically read data. And so this was, uh, there were a couple of occasions over the course of like the last six months that I was doing this research where I did actually need to change things on my account. Um, and when I did that, and if I had time, I would try to do that over the phone just to see what happened. But the interesting thing with that is that changing things on your account sometimes did trigger additional security. And that makes sense, right? Uh, you know, from the development perspective, you're, you know, we're, a lot of times we're more concerned with who has delete access to the database and who has read access. Um, and so this is something that I, I don't know if every single person that I called, they might have had additional security measures, but most of the time I was getting uh, read information. Uh, so for example, when I called American Express, uh, when I called in to get information about my account, I could have gotten my account balance or uh, information about my last bill just by validating my phone number, but I needed to have them send me a new credit card. And when I did that, they went through the additional step of sending me an SMS token. So here are some examples of the places that I called. Overall, I called about 30 companies, which doesn't seem like a lot, but once you spend 25 minutes on the phone with CVS, uh, on hold with CVS, and then you get connected to an agent and they immediately hang up on you, it adds up. Uh, so I'll talk about some of these in detail later in my talk. Uh, I'm definitely gonna call out the places that are doing things well. Uh, for the places that aren't doing things well, I'm just going to be talking more generically about them because I haven't disclosed any of this to any of these places. And so basically I want to give examples of people that we can emulate and not necessarily shame the people that are doing things badly. Uh, so my goal was to call all these businesses and there were a few common ways to do that. Uh, most retail, uh, insurance, banking, places like that have made it easy for you to find their customer support line. Uh, some of these places even prefer that you call them over getting some kind of text-based support either through a forum or uh, sending them an email. And so especially those utility companies like Comcast, you want to call, you want to do something with your account. They like it when you call them because then they can try to talk you out of canceling your account, right? Uh, more sophisticated tech companies, and so places like Walmart and Amazon did this, they make it really hard for you to find a customer support number. Instead, what they'll do is if you can even get to the call me phase of, the, uh, of their customer support help page on their website, if you get to that page that's talking about talk to somebody on the phone, they'll prompt you with this call me feature, which is basically saying, give us your phone number, your name, and maybe some information about the problem you're having, and we'll call you back when we have an agent available. And I get this, this is probably for efficiency reasons. Call centers are incredibly expensive to run, and so a lot of these places have tried to optimize that as much as possible. Uh, the other thing that I thought was interesting is there's tech companies out there that just don't have a phone number. Um, so Facebook's an example of this. Uh, they actually, they do have a phone number, but when you call it and go through their automated system to get uh, support over the phone, they tell you they don't offer over the phone support and they hang up on you. And so that's fine. That's one thing, that's a decision that they've made. I couldn't for the life of me find a uh, customer support line for Lyft. Uh, it was something that I looked for for a while. They might have something for drivers, but they don't have anything for passengers like me to call. But for consistency, I, I tried to focus on option one, right? I wanted to make uh, the inbound calls to the contact centers. I don't know if option two would have uh, offered that much of a difference, but I focused on option one as much as possible. Obviously option three was a little uh, impossible for me to call into those places. So once you actually connect to these places, there are a lot of similarities between uh, how companies are building out their customer support lines. So IVR is this interactive voice response. It's an acronym you'll hear a lot in terms of call centers. And so most places are building these type of automated IVRs so they can do things like if you're an insurance company, say press one to file a claim, press two to get a quote, and that's how they'll direct you to the right use case. Unfortunately, if you actually end up talking to an agent, those IVRs are great for doing the automated systems if you just need to call in and take an action without talking to a human. But if you end up talking to a human, almost never did they take uh, into consideration the, the IVR path that I, I took. Um, most of that could have been because I was just trying to press zero to get to an agent as quickly as possible. But you know, sometimes you have to get creative with how you end up actually talking to a human. 
And there's also a few ways that people are commonly identifying you once you get on the phone. Uh, so the first is that they're, they're automatically detecting your account or your information with the phone number that you're calling in from. And so they use a caller ID system to look up the account. And if you have your phone number tied to their, your account, they will, uh, do some infer they will do some analysis and look up your account for you based on that information. Uh, the other way that they will do this is once you get on the phone, they might prompt you to input something like an account number, an insurance ID, your credit card number. And this is a way that they can also look up your account based on some kind of company specific number that isn't your phone number that they can index and look up your account by. And then if none of those work, then you have to be identified with an agent. Um, and the agent will also do some manual verification of your identity. And that's what the meat of this talk is going to be talking about. But identifying you, and I want to emphasize this point, identifying you is not the same as authenticating you. So I can give you my phone number, but there's a lot of people that have my phone number. There are several people in this audience that have my phone number. They could call into a lot of these places and give them my phone number to identify themselves, but they're not me. And so how do I, as somebody that actually owns that phone number, prove that I am me? And this is the challenge that we're all facing all the time, right? Identity verification is a very hard problem. And it's very hard because a lot of times we're never going to know if we got it right. So for the purposes of this talk, identity is going to be things that are static information, facts about you. These are things that probably aren't going to change. This is something like your date of birth. A lot of this stuff is Googleable. If you have access to the person's Instagram, you probably can find out a lot of this information. Whereas authentication is how you prove that identity. And this can be done with a secret. And so these are things like passwords that we use online. These are also things like one-time codes that you can be sent with something that you have like your phone. And so a lot of times when we're talking about two-factor authentication, we talk about the different types of factors. So these are something that you know, like a password, something that you have like a phone, something that you are like a biometric that's a little bit harder to do over the phone, so I didn't see any of that. But these are the types of factors that you can do to actually authenticate users. And the problem here, like I mentioned, identity is not authentication. But we're constantly using identity to prove other parts of our identity, right? And this is especially true when you're calling into contact centers. How many people have had to give out their social security number over the phone? Everybody's hand should be up. You've all had to do that. <laughs> it's one of those things that you can't actually verify who you are by giving somebody your date of birth. This is something that a lot of like pharmacies will do when you go in to pick up a prescription. If you give them your name and your date of birth, they trust that you're you. They don't actually ask for an ID. They just need to know that you have that information about yourself, and then you can get somebody's medications. And so this identity information is not a secret. It's just a piece of information that isn't going to change. And I'd really like to see that change. I'd love it if I never had to give out my social security number over the phone ever again, uh, because especially after breaches like Equifax, where now people probably have my social security number, and you can get that information if you have enough money and access to the dark web, these are things that people can use to steal my identity, steal your identity, and it's not something that I want to be reliant on in terms of getting information over the phone or in any other type of system. But this is hard, right? We can't reasonably expect people to be inputting passwords like we do online uh, in websites or even in mobile apps. And so we have to think about the user experience for the over the phone systems in a different way than we do for websites. But we still want to maintain the same rigor there because otherwise we introduce ourselves to a lot of risk by having a customer support line. The other problem here is that a lot of phone systems predate websites. People have had phone lines for a lot longer than the internet has existed. And so these are usually antiquated systems that might not have the same uh, technology and type of configurability behind them that a lot of websites have these days. And so you get these disconnected systems that are using different ways to authenticate each other. And it, you know, it makes sense. They're different. Uh, channels that you're using, and I get it, but it's something that is, is introducing additional challenges to making this a secure platform. So let's look at some of the results. All of this is very messy, um, but I want to show you what I found, starting with the types of identifiers and occasional authenticators that I saw when I called into customer contact centers. 
And so uh, this chart, it's a little bit hard to read on the bottom, but starting to the left, we have phone numbers, which were the most common uh, identifiers that I found. And this makes sense, right? You're calling in. They're either using your phone number to identify you or asking you for your phone number. After that, we have email and your physical address, shortly followed by your name. And then it drops off a little bit to things like account numbers. Account numbers, I basically grouped together as anything that was specific to the account that you were calling in about. And so this was everything from like a credit card number to your insurance insurance ID to when you call into Apple, they ask you for a device ID on your actual iPhone. And so those were types of uh, information that uh, they asked you about that were specific to an account. Uh, there was a lot of people that were asking me for my social security number, my date of birth. And then at the end, it's interesting because you get a few actual authenticators. And so these are things like your PIN number, like a four digit PIN, um, something like an SMS uh, authentication token that they will send you. A service code. I'll, I'll show you an example of how Netflix does that later. And finally, I had one uh, major shipping company that just asked me for my password so they could log into my account for me. <laughs> I thought that was a little interesting. I did not give that to them. Uh, <laughs> I decided that I didn't need that information badly enough to give them that information. But this is something that a lot of people would do if they were calling in. I'm a security paranoid person, but if somebody actually needed to talk to somebody and get something changed on their account, you know, especially if they don't have a 16-digit randomly generated password, they probably would just give that to the agent. We're all very trusting people. We want to get to the answer. They're just trying to help. It's this ongoing problem. Of, at the end of the day, humanity is trying to be good, and they're trying to be helpful. So let's look at some of the more qualitative data and break it down into what some companies are doing right, all the way down to what scared me. Uh, so the good, let's start with the good. This, this was possible, there are examples of people that are doing this well, and mostly this came down to people that are actually authenticating users. And so this included things like one-time codes for authentication, also refusing to disclose personal information. And so I wasn't trying to be nefarious in any of this, but I actually, I did just move, and so some of the times that I was on the phone with people, I'd, I'd ask them to confirm or tell me what mailing address I had on my account so that I would know if I had updated it yet. And most places would not give me that information, but there were some that did. And that's a problem, right? Because if you're giving out additional identity information, as we saw in the previous slide, some places are using your address to verify you. And so if you can fish that out of somebody over the phone, you can get that information so you can have additional information. And then you can, as an attacker, be more effective at what you're trying to do. Uh, I was put on hold a lot, but I did want to mention as a very bonus delight, Apple lets you choose your hold music, which were, they were the only per people that did that when I called in. So, you know, it's all about the experience, right? You want to make people less miserable at the end of the day. Uh, so let's look at an example of authentication. I thought Netflix did a really good job of this. And so when you call into Netflix, uh, you'll get this message that says, welcome to Netflix for faster service. Log into your Netflix account and find the six digit service code at the bottom of any page. And so if you do that, you can go to your Netflix account and sure enough, at the bottom of your page, there is the service code. You click on that and you get a six digit number that you can then give to the agent over the phone and that helps facilitate the authentication. Uh, this doesn't seem to be tied to a session. I did try logging out and in and see if that changed. Uh, so that didn't change the, the token. I don't know exactly how they do this. If anybody works at Netflix and wants to tell me how you do this later, if that's something you're willing to share, I'd be very curious. But this is, all right, I'll, I'll come talk to you later. Uh, but this is something that I thought was really interesting. And so I did check this over the course of several days. And it basically, within 24 hours, it definitely changed. And so my theory that it's some kind of time-based code, right? And this probably isn't that hard to implement, right? You could use some kind of secret attached to the account, and that would only generate this code when the user is an authenticated session. And so this isn't that different from like an authy-based TOTP or time-based one-time code that you could use for something like Google Authenticator. Uh, it was definitely longer than 30 seconds or whatever you use there. But uh, we'll, we'll talk later. Uh, but this is really nice. Like the point of this is that this makes the experience over the phone much smoother, and it's also more secure because unless you have somebody that's you know authenticated into a session uh, under your account, which you know we all share Netflix passwords, so that's you know a problem could be a problem. But it's still offering actual authentication at the end of the day, which is something that was more rare than than not. 
Another uh, example of good authentication came from Amex. Like I mentioned, I needed them to send me a new credit card. Um, and so what happened is there was two good things that uh, happened here. And so I was talking to one person on the line and they told me, uh, one second, if that's what you need to do, I need to bring in our, our, a specialist to help me do this. And so he connected me with a specialist and that specialist both knew what I was trying to do once I got on the phone with him so I didn't have to re-explain it, which was really good. Uh, but then he was the one that also said, uh, let me send you a one-time code and I can do this, I can send you a credit card once I, you repeat that code back to me, right? And so this is a pretty straightforward way that also doesn't require a lot of, you don't have to download an additional app. There's a lot of uh, usability that comes with this while also making it a little bit more secure. The only thing here that I'm not a huge fan of is that it doesn't uh, provide any context in this message. And so it just says this is an Amex fraud message. And so if somebody was trying to attack me, that would be something that I wouldn't really know what to do with. But at least they do provide that phone number that I can call to uh, report it if there's something that goes wrong. Uh, let's talk about some of the okay things. And overall, I thought this was pretty positive. This is where like most people fell into. Uh, so there's room for improvement here, but this is still overall positive. And maybe these are companies that did the cost analysis and decided it wasn't worth it to implement the additional features. Maybe they're not super concerned about the security under the hood. Maybe the, you know it doesn't cost them a lot of money if people do things to the user accounts. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but here were some of the things that I thought uh, most companies were doing well. And that's even recognizing the phone number that you're calling in from, I thought was nice from a user experience perspective. And also, you know, you could you could script that, but it is a little bit more challenging to uh, to spoof a phone number than it is to just give somebody your phone number, right? You have to have a little bit more technical know-how in order to do that. Um, and so it's something that you know makes it a little bit more challenging for people to uh, try to uh, attack you with. Uh, also, verifying multiple forms of personal information. So if you're not going to do true authentication, the very least that you can do is get multiple pieces of information uh, from the end user so that you can at least know that they don't just uh, have an email that they found uh, uh, laying around some website. Uh, and finally, prompting with any kind of relevant account actions. This is more related to the user experience, but I think this was helpful because it also saved me time, and it usually directed me to something that I thought was a little bit more relevant to what I was trying to do. Uh, so an example of that, I know we all love United Airlines, but I actually think that their, uh, their automated phone system is not that bad. I'm a United flyer, for better or for worse, and so I call them a lot. But when I call United, they say, welcome back, Kelly, and I'm like, oh, nice, you know who I am. You treat me like a human, how lovely. Uh, so they say, you know, but They'll also say, they'll prompt me with relevant actions, right? I see, that if I call them today, they would say, I see that you're flying from Los Angeles to Newark. You know, we'll see how that goes today. Uh, but are you calling about that trip? Um, and this is useful because it allows me to both, they're already connected to my account, they already know about my upcoming flight, um, and so I can jump forward to something that's a little bit more useful to me. And then if you actually do try to take action on your, uh, if you try to change your flight, they will ask you for additional information from here, but this is a good place to start. Um, I do want to point out there's a risk here because they, when you prompt with relevant account information, you are uh, running the risk of giving back more information about the person at the end of the day. So this is kind of ephemeral information. You know, my people could track down my location based on my flight information. But there were also there were utility companies that I called, and if I called in from my phone number, they would say, "Hi Kelly, are you calling about your account at 123 Main Street, Apartment 7?" I'm like, well, yeah, I am, but now I'm a little worried that you are just prompting me with that information. <laughs> and so I, I wouldn't recommend that you do things like that, right? So you can prompt people with relevant account actions, but try not to give them that kind of identity information about them, right? Like this flight that I'm taking is not part of my identity. That's something that I could cancel or change. All right, let's talk about some of the bad things that happened. Um, and this I kind of categorized as phishing with minimal risk. And so the biggest problem here is people that only ask for one form of identity. And so these were either people that recognized your, for your phone number and then just didn't ask you any additional questions. They looked up your account by your email and again, didn't ask you any additional questions. Um, and also the other problem is when people were asking you for identity, maybe even two pieces of identity, but that's all very easily findable public information, right? If you know somebody's phone number and email address, which think about the number of people that you know their phone number and their email address, it's a lot of people, there's a lot of places that you could get into their accounts over the phone. And that's bad because you don't want to have your only verification be these publicly available pieces of information. If you watch anybody that does any social engineering, it's really fascinating because you can find out all of this information about people relatively, relatively easily. 
Uh, and finally, just requiring a social security number. I'm just, I'm not a fan of this, and I want to talk about why. Uh, does anybody know who this woman is? I promise this is relevant. So, uh, social security numbers are useful for identity because they're not easily Googleable. But they're also not an authenticator because even though we treat them like a secret, they aren't. We can't easily change them. They are a piece of our identity, and this is going to be very inconvenient for you if anybody ever finds out your social security number. So Mrs. Hilda Schrader Witcher was the secretary for the CEO of a wallet manufacturer back in the early 20th century. And when social security cards were invented, this wallet manufacturer wanted to promote the fact that their wallets could easily hold social security cards. And instead of printing a fake social security number on the card that they sold with their wallet, they printed Mrs. Hilda Schrader Witcher's real social security number on all of those cards. And these were disseminated to thousands and thousands of people. And she ended up having to change her social security number. But as recent as 1977, there were still 22 people using that social security number as their own. And this is a problem because social security numbers were invented for social security. They were never intended to be used for tax purposes or for employment purposes or for getting a US credit card. And so this is something that's been completely overloaded and used beyond its original intention. And this is something that we're constantly asking for in terms of accessing financial data. And it's very problematic. Let's use actual authenticators instead of using this ever again. And if I didn't scare you enough, on top of that, unless you're eight years old or younger, which it doesn't look like anybody in here is, social security numbers were issued serially until 2011. So everybody born in 1986, just like come compare your social security numbers. Over, it's a fun game. Try it later at the bar. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to find people with social security numbers similar to you. Uh, but you can do this. You can basically track down somebody's or guess their social security number and narrow it down if you know. You know, it's, it's binary search. It's all the same thing. <laughs> so that's, that's bad, right? Like you don't want to be using social security numbers for identifiers. But this is not the worst of what I saw. So this is all stuff that happened. Uh, the first one, giving out identity information. This is more common than I would have liked. So I want to tell you a story of what happened when I called a major uh, US hotel chain. And so I called in, and I was asking for them to email me a, a folio of my most recent state with them. And so I called them, and I got on the phone with somebody, and she so when I called in, they said, we don't recognize the phone number that you're calling from, uh, so please enter your phone number. And so I did that, and then I didn't really say anything after I did that, but then I ended up getting connected to an agent. And so she asked me for my email address, and she looked up my most recent stay, and then she's like, okay, I've emailed you the folio, you should be receiving it in you know, the next five to 15 minutes or something. I didn't see it come through. A lot of times when they say that, like the email actually comes through right away, but I didn't see it come through to my email. And I didn't really think too much of it, but then after she did that and we'd had, you know, been on the phone for maybe five minutes at that point, I asked her about my phone number. I was like, is there not a phone number on my account? She's like, no, there is. I was like, well, what's the phone number on my account? At this point, I was just confused. Like, I didn't really know what was going on. This is like a hotel chain that I've stayed at, you know, for the last 10 years. And so it's something that I, I assumed had a phone number attached to my account. Um, and so she gave me the phone number. It was not mine. I wrote it down because I was confused. And at this point, I still kind of thought that maybe somebody had just changed the information on my account. You know, stuff happens. Uh, but after I hung up with her, well, actually, before I hung up, she asked me if I wanted to update the phone number on my account. I was like, yes, please. And so I changed the phone number to my phone number on that account. And when I hung up, um, I used this handy tool that we have to actually look up that phone number. And I found out that it belonged to a Kathy Robinson. So my name is Kelly Robinson. My email has information about my name in it. And so my theory, my working theory, is that she typed in my email wrong and that I updated my phone number on Kathy Robinson's account. <laughs> And this was all, I was not trying to do this. I promise you, I did not set out to do anything illegal. But this is like, that, that's the accidental phishing that I did, right? And this is crazy because she was just trying to be helpful. I was just trying to get my account information updated. But when I went and logged into my account online for that hotel, there wasn't a phone number on my account. And my email was attached to that account. And so I think what had happened is I just had never set my phone number on that account. And now poor Kathy has my phone number. <laughs> 
So there are a few places that this happened, right? They would give out this information, they would make these account changes without actually doing any kind of validation or doing any kind of true authentication. And that's something that I don't think should be able to happen. Uh, finally, there were a couple of places that would do actual SMS authentication, uh, but one of these places actually asked me what phone number to send the SMS code to, which kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, actually, Amex did this as well, but they, they quickly clarified that they were doing that to, so this was a different circumstance, they clarified that they were doing that as another form of verification so that I was giving them, they could make sure I was giving them the phone number that was also tied to my account. And that's fine. But if you're asking somebody what email to send a security code to, what phone number, completely defeats the purpose, right? Any kind of attacker can give you whatever email they just have access to at that point. So what are we going to do about this? First of all, stock photos of call centers. Everyone looks so happy. <laughs> this was not my experience. People were generally friendly, right? You know, people are just trying to help you. And I think that's what happened with the hotel, right? Like she just wanted to help me at the end of the day. She didn't do anything wrong with her job. It was the systems that failed her. Um, and so that brings us nicely into my first recommendation, which is unify your authentication systems as much as possible. And this is tough because you can't reasonably expect users to input their passwords over the phone. So you're going to have to have some differences there, but you want to hold them to the same rigor of authentication that you would for your online systems. And that includes things like honoring uh, settings for 2FA. And so I wanted to talk about what happened with Amazon when I called them. And overall, Amazon goes into that two thumbs up category. They do a really good job of authenticating you over the phone. Um, but let's talk through kind of what happened when I, when I decided to call Amazon. So first of all, when you try to find the phone number, they do not make it easy for you to find this phone number. So if you can even get to this page, which is, you know, talk to an Amazon support agent over the phone, they want you to have them call you. And so they do this like call me feature, input your phone number, and we'll call you when we have an agent available. But I wanted to call them. And so at the very bottom here, they have this footnote that says you can call our general help number. <laughs> Click on that, you can get access to this toll free number. So now that I have that number, I call it and I'm prompted with some authentication. And this is pretty cool because their IVR will automatically do this without before you actually get uh, connected to an agent. Uh, and so they send you this, uh, this SMS message that you have to reply to. It has some nice context in there that says, are you calling Amazon? It's just enough effort that you're probably not going to accidentally respond yes to this if you're not calling them. Uh, and so I like that it does this. I like that it provides the context. This is an actual authentication step, right? Um, so I talk to my rep, I ask about my recent order or something, um, and then I ask about my address and what information they have about me on the screen. Um, and so we get into a, a small conversation about this and the agent says, you know, I have your address and I have your phone number, but I can only use those for verification purposes, I can't give those out to you. And so I asked some questions, what would be the circumstance that you would need to verify that information? And they were like, well, you know, I, they didn't really have a good answer for that, but um, I think what they must have done is flagged something on my account that said I was concerned about the security on my account because five minutes after I hung up with Amazon, they sent me this email. It was a message from customer service. And they said, if you have concerns regarding your account security, we recommend setting a very strong password, which I thought was interesting because I had just called them on the phone. They had never asked for my password. I don't expect that they ever would ask for my password. And so I thought it was an interesting disconnect here that they were sending me this message as a recommendation after I had gotten off the phone with them. And so I, I like what they're doing here. You know, they're, they're trying to uh, encourage better account security. They already have some really good practices, but there is this kind of disconnect, right? Uh, this wouldn't actually help the situation that I was trying to inquire about while I was on the phone. But the other thing that I think is interesting is I, I do have a strong password on my Amazon account, but I also have uh, 2FA set up, but I have it set up via TOTP with the Authy app. Uh, and so they never at any point asked me to give the TOTP code that was in my Authy app. They did send me that SMS authentication, but theoretically someone like Amazon could implement it so they would be asking for my TOTP instead of an SMS verification. And so that was a setting that I have decided I wanted to add increased security for my Amazon account and I'm going to use TOTP instead of SMS 2FA for that account. Um, but at no point did they actually ask for that information. And that's because these systems are fragmented, right? I, I don't like to pick on Amazon because, again, I think they do an overall really good job. They were definitely like one of the best ones that I ended up calling in the course of this research. But I think this is a good example of how some of this stuff gets, gets fragmented. 
And that brings me to my second uh, recommendation, which is to build guardrails for your agents. So you obviously want to spend time training your agents and giving them that information. They shouldn't be giving out personal information and that kind of stuff. But you also want to make it easy for them to succeed at doing that by not exposing them to more risk than they need to. And so some of the ways that you can do this are limit the caller information that's available to them. Uh, I don't know why the Amazon agent needed to see my address at that point because at no point was I asking for address information. Uh, you can also only expose information after the user has been authenticated and maybe that was the case with them, right? Like maybe they don't see any information about me until I go through that authentication process. Uh, as with the Amex example, I think you can have a small subset of agents that are specially trained to do the high-risk behaviors. Um, and so that limits your, your uh, potential attack vector if you have to direct people that are trying to do sensitive actions to a smaller group of specially trained agents. And then finally, you can perform silent authentication. So there's a lot of things that you can do behind the scenes to detect fraud without actually requiring that the agent do anything themselves. And so an example of how you could build guardrails for your agents is these are two examples of a dashboard for verifying an email address. Uh, so I called into one place and they, they asked me to verify my email address. Um, and I gave them my email address and they were like, well, no, that's not it. And then I gave them another email address and they're like, no, that's not it either. And I was like, what, what email address did I use for this account? And I was confused. I was genuinely confused about what email address I had used for this account because, you know, as we all do, it's one of like three or four probably. Uh, and so they, they ended up giving me the entire domain and TLD of the email address that I used. But again, this agent was just trying to be helpful. And I was able, once I had that information, I was like, oh, well, obviously it's this. And they're like, yeah, that's right, and then we moved on. But that would only happen if they had a view like on the left, right? They wouldn't be able to help me out like that if they had a view like on the right. And there is this trade-off here, right, between getting a, a useful experience for both agent and customer. It's also probably faster if you have option one, but option two is going to be a little bit more secure because you can't accidentally give out more information than you need to to the other person on the end of the line. Uh, so you might get pushed back on something like option two because uh, I think I mentioned before, call centers are a huge expense for a lot of companies and people are co constantly trying to minimize costs there. And so they want you to spend as little time on the phone with an agent as, as possible. Uh, and so I think option two is a little bit more secure here, but your mileage may vary. Uh, there's other things that you can think about here. It's, since time is a big consideration for most people, uh, there's a few other things that you can do to support your agents, and that's things like, there's a lot of information attached to a phone number. There's a lot of information attached to an email. There are services out there that you can use to get fraud and risk in information that are tied to those types, of, uh, those types of identity information. And so you can do this. This is part of the silent authentication that you can do behind the scenes that you could then attach a risk uh, a metric to, if that's helpful, or you could redirect those type of people if they do clock in as being a more risky type of individual, you could redirect them to your specialized agents, or at least set a flag on their account that there might be more risky behavior that's happening with this person. Um, you could also terminate the call if it comes in and you're like pretty sure it's, it's spam. There's a lot of call centers that are starting to do this type of activity to help minimize the risks associated with, uh, with the phishing attempts on their, on their support agents. And that brings us nicely to, uh, we always need to consider our threat model, right? And so what are you allowing people to do over the phone? Uh, I think it was UPS that I called that I was trying to change the, uh, the address on my account. And they were just like, we're, we, we can't do that over the phone. Like, I don't know if that was a security reason or they just didn't have the resources to do that. Um, but I thought that that was fine, right? Like they, they gave me very nice instructions for how to do that on the website. The website that I use for that has, you know, a strong password associated with it and all that stuff. And so when they wanted to help me out, they, they gave me instructions for how to redirect me to a more secure environment than over the phone. And this is totally a fine option for you. If you don't want to have expose yourself to that kind of risk uh, in a call center, and especially if it's not something that like is the user is getting having issues actually accessing their online account, there are ways that you can direct people to do sensitive actions. Just make them do that online. Again, just everybody is so happy. So what's next? Um, I think there are more options here. So the future of call center authentication is going to include a lot of things like more SMS codes, in-app authentication, um, 
And so if the user already has the app installed, you can do something like this. And so on the left here, we have a view of a call center dashboard. And on the right, you have an app that you can authenticate yourself. And then the agent gets a view of what you've done uh, with the authentication. And this is probably very similar to the Amex example, where they only get information about you uh, or able to move forward once that awaiting approval turns green. Um, the only thing that I would change about this is this does have you know, a phone number and a delivery address on that. One thing that you could change is only exposing that information once you actually have authenticated the user. Um, we also we have a lot of data about users, and I think we'll see more things like fingerprinting and advancements in behind the scenes uh, fraud detection in call centers. Uh, so some of the takeaways from this, uh, identity is not authentication. If at all possible, use real authentication. Uh, never provide additional personal information to the caller. This is usually not necessary. And so that's partially agent training, but partially building those guardrails for your agents. Uh, think about how you built the authentication systems for your website and your, your apps, and apply the same rigor to your phone authentication. Honor things like user settings for two-factor authentication. Uh, make it hard for your agents to mess up. Don't let them access information that they don't need. Uh, I don't blame any of the agents that I talked to that you know helped me out there because they were just trying to do their jobs. Humans want to be helpful. You know they might. I don't know if I ever answered a, like a survey at the end of these, but they want to make sure their customer support scores are are high. And if they're you know, refusing me information, that might get them a negative review. And finally, figure out what makes sense for your business. Figure out if this investment is worth it to you. So like everything, there's no perfect solution here. Uh, but I hope I've given you some ideas for how you can think about the security of your over the phone authentication systems. If your company has a customer support line, call it, take notes. I think you'll be interested to see what you find. Uh, come find me after this if you have any questions. Once again, my name is Kelly Robinson, not Kathy Robinson. Uh, and thank you for listening. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, I was just wondering, what are these your thoughts on using recent transactions people have been doing with the service as a form of authentication? So is this like asking about recent credit card transactions as a way to identify yeah. you? Somebody was just mentioning this to me the other day, and that does involve that you have access to that recent information. I'm not sure if financial institutions have an API for that. Um, maybe we can talk later about how people are doing that. I haven't, I didn't encounter any of that in my research, but it is something that I've heard of people doing. So basically you'll call in and like, in the same way that when you're uh, applying for a credit card, they might ask you like, which of these three addresses did you live at in the last 10 years? Um, they might ask you like what was the amount that you spent at CVS last Tuesday and so that's I mean it's, it's clever right and like I don't know exactly how that's done but I think that is an interesting way to start authenticating people because it is more of a secret than it is identity information other questions over here Follow-up comment to that. Doesn't that mean that the agent now has some additional insight into your account? Yeah, it could, but maybe they don't. Uh, you could either do that in an automated way. Maybe they only have uh, specific information about that transaction. They might not know what you bought in that way. I mean, I, again, I'll have to do additional research into what how people are exactly doing this. It's not something that I personally encountered, but I think there is a way that you could do this. That would it would at least be better than just using your phone number for authentication. Fair point. Thank you. Uh, really good research, Kathy, Kelly. Um, <laughs> given that the root of trust for a lot of these systems is unfortunately still your phone number, mm -hmm. did you do any assessments against the phone providers themselves and kind of an, any assessment about how hard it would be to do something like a phone number port? I haven't tried that. Again, I didn't try to do anything nefarious, but it was interesting. So when I called AT&T, um, which is my phone provider, and now you all know that, uh, so <laughs> they they do have a PIN number associated with my account, but they were one of the examples where I was like, what they, they asked what my PIN was, I gave them one information, and then they were like, oh, that's not it. And I was like, oh, well, it must be this other thing. And so they let me try again. Um, and so this is, you know, part of how this, this shit happens, right? Like you can easily fish these people, and that's why people are concerned about porting and that kind of thing. Um, I don't have a good answer to that. I haven't tried to actually sim swap myself. I'm probably not going to try to do it to anyone else because I don't know the legal ramifications of that. I don't want to go to jail. Thank you. Yeah. 
Anyone else? Awesome. Thank you all. <laughs>